All right, take out your Bibles, Revelation 16, second part is where we're going to finish off today. And just wanted to give you a quick update. I won't have a health update necessarily every week, but we had told you last Sunday that this past week was a pretty big one for us in regards to uh, my cancer diagnosis and treatment prognosis and all those things. Um, so on Monday, we met with one doctor, and that doctor offered the most um, intense version of chemo. That's what he was suggesting. <laughs> Um, and then we met with an expert on Wednesday and he said, no way uh, to that chemo. He said he hasn't given that chemo in 15 years. And he said there are many other effective and great options uh, available. None are pleasant, but there's better treatment options. So um, over the next few weeks, we've got some logistics to work out and so on. But we'll keep you guys updated on all that. All right. So why don't we go ahead and pray and ask God to bless this time and his word together. So Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can call you our Father, that you actually are, that through faith in Christ you have adopted us and made us your own. And so we just thank you that we have a heavenly Father who provides for us, who protects us, and who prepares us for the days ahead. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless your children this morning, that you would speak to us through your holy word, and that we would learn much from you today. May your Holy Spirit give us great understanding into these great truths. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You notice I'm wearing my dad's shirt this morning. Uh, my wife and kids got this for me, I don't know, last year or so. Uh, but the back of it has a definition that says, uh, the one who believes in you and tells the best jokes. <laughs> and so it is Dad Jokes 2021. My one opportunity out of the year to tell awful, cringeworthy jokes. Um, because I don't tell jokes really in most of my messages anyway. So this is my one day where I get to. So you ready for it? Here we go. When does a joke become a dad joke? When the punchline becomes apparent. <laughs> I don't trust stares. They're always up to something. I used to hate facial hair, but then it grew on me. Mom said I should do lunges to stay in shape. That would be a big step forward. What does a baby computer call his father? Data. My friend was showing me his tool shed and pointed to a ladder. That's my step ladder. He said, I never really knew my real ladder. <laughs> Which days are the strongest? Saturday and Sunday. The rest are weekdays. What's the difference between a well-dressed man on a unicycle and a poorly dressed man on a bicycle? A tire. Of all the inventions of the last hundred years, the dry erase board has to be the most remarkable. <laughs> My hotel tried to charge me $10 extra for air conditioning. That wasn't cool. <laughs> what do you call a beehive without an exit? Unbelievable. <laughs> How come the Hulk doesn't lose his pants when he transforms? The experiment altered his genes. <laughs> what do you call a Frenchman wearing sandals? Philippe flop. <laughs> Did you know that the first French fries weren't cooked in France? They were cooked in Greece. <laughs> ah, see, these are bad. <laughs> That was like the grody, like, uh, that's what happens when I tell jokes to my children. All right. This morning, Siri said, don't call me Shirley. I accidentally left my phone in airplane mode. See, some of you don't get that cultural reference. I have to slow it down for some of you. I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know. See, you have to wait. I asked my date to meet me at the gym, but she never showed up. I guess the two of us aren't going to work out. <laughs> the difference between a numerator and a denominator is a short line. Only a fraction of people will understand this. <laughs> I sat between two twins in calculus class. It was difficult to differentiate between the two of them. <laughs> See, <laughs> guys don't get it. To, to whoever stole my copy of Microsoft Office, I will find you. You have my word. I found a wooden shoe in my toilet today. It was clogged. Ah, bad. Have you heard about these new corduroy pillows? They're making headlines. A panic-stricken man, a panic-stricken man explained to his doctor, you have to help me, I think I'm shrinking. 
Now settle, settle down, the doctor calmly told him. You'll just have to learn to be a little patient. <laughs> what do you call a bundle of hay in a church? Christian Bale. <laughs> Cultural reference. Say, a ship carrying red paint and a ship carrying blue paint collide in the middle of the ocean. Both crews were marooned. <laughs> in 2017, I didn't do a marathon. I didn't do one in 2018, 2019, or 2020 either. This is a running joke. <laughs> marathon, didn't do them. Yeah. Not to brag, but I made six figures last year. I was also named the worst employee at the toy factory. <laughs> Ever since we started quarantining, I've been telling inside jokes. <laughs> I heard Sony's coming out with a new video game console during the pandemic. It's called the Plague Station 5. <laughs> There's some bad ones. I'm not going to lie. What do you call a sad cup of coffee? Depresso. <laughs> if you're feeling depressed, try drinking a gallon of water before you go to sleep. It'll give you a reason to get out of the bed in the morning. <laughs> Why did the invisible man turn down a job offer? He couldn't see himself doing it. I just found out I'm colorblind. The news came out of the purple. Colorblind? Not blue, purple. Wow. All right. A cop started crying when he was giving me a ticket. I asked him why, and he said, it's a moving violation. My wife told me she didn't understand clothing, cloning. I told her that makes two of us. I'd like to have kids one day. I don't think I could stand them any longer than that, though. <laughs> All right, only a few more. My daughter just shrieked at me. Dad, you haven't listened to a word I've said, have you? What an odd way to begin a conversation. <laughs> Dad, can you explain to me what a solar eclipse is? No, son. Yesterday, I was washing the car with my son. He said, Dad, can't you just use a sponge? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I like that one. My parents raised me as an only child, which really annoyed my younger brother. <laughs> Today, I decided to go visit my childhood home. I asked the residents if I could come inside because I was feeling nostalgic, but they refused and slammed the door in my face. My parents are the worst. <laughs> and last but not least, what's your name, son? The principal asked the student. The kid replied, D -d 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 David, sir. Do you have a stutter? The principal asked. The student answered, no, sir. My dad has a stutter, but the guy who registered my name was a real jerk. <laughs> Somebody who had a stutter when they were young, I can get away with that one. But all fun aside, let's talk about a dad's role just for a moment. I was thinking through it, and a dad is meant to prepare their child for what's ahead, uh, to provide for their children spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, and social needs. But did you notice the first one I mentioned? Spiritual needs. This is a role and a responsibility um, many fathers don't take seriously. They take other roles in priority over this one, sometimes neglecting it altogether. Um, and that shouldn't be. The first thing we should do as fathers is to lead our children in the Lord. And it's never too late to do so. Even if they've grown up and they're out of the house, we can still be an example of Christ to our kids. And so that is our primary role, but it's also to protect our children from sin and sinners, from getting seduced by it, and by becoming a victim from it, from the ways in which others might treat them or harm them. But let's focus on this role of preparation for a moment, because this passage we're in today is a passage of preparation. And a father should prepare their kids, just as you know, we're going through this medical journey um, with the cancer that was recently diagnosed. We are seeking to always, we've tried, but even in this, preparing our kids for what's ahead, telling them about what's going on. And, and one of the ways in which we prepare our kids is we speak truth to them. We don't sugarcoat it. We don't give them a rosy picture. We tell them exactly what they, what they need to hear, but also what's appropriate for their age. And 
in this last update, we were talking to the kids, and this is when chemo looked like it was still on the table, and Jen was explaining to all the kids what that would look like and how I could be in the hospital for some time if there was a bone marrow transplant as an option in the future, which doesn't look like it, but where I'd maybe have to be in the hospital for 30 days or an extended period of time. And Landon, our youngest, was just getting really frustrated. He's like, oh, we're like, Jen's like, buddy, like, well, what's going on? And he's like, oh, and we're talking about how, and she's like, well, like, sweetheart, you got to understand the doctors will be able to give daddy the best care and the best treatment that he needs. And he throws his head back on the couch, slides down it, you know, as like a nine-year-old does. And he goes, oh, and he goes, and she goes, what? He goes, don't they know mom that you give him the best treatment and care? <laughs> right? But in our preparation of our children, it's important for them to know what to expect, what's happening ahead. And I don't know if you've ever heard the song by Johnny Cash, A Boy Named Sue. That is not how you want to prepare your child. <laughs> this is how the song goes. Basically, there's a son who's singing this song, and his dad, the only thing he did before he left him and his mother was name him this awful name, Sue. Now, as a boy, that's not a fun name to have. And so this boy grew up having to fight and claw his way through life. The son swore that if he ever found his dear old pa, he would kill him for giving him that name. Well, he ended up at a bar one day, and this is like Western time as the context, and he sees his old pa playing cards. And so he walks up to him, he says, my name is Sue, how do you do? Now you're going to die. And the father and son get in a fist fight that ends with each man going for their gun, but the son drew his gun first. Then the father before the son shoots him, explains to his son why he named him that awful name. He says, son, this world is rough, and if a man's going to make it, he's got to be tough. And I knew I wouldn't be there to help you along. So I gave you that name, and I said goodbye. I knew you'd have to get tough or die, and it's that name that helped to make you strong. He said, now you just fought one heck of a fight, and I know you hate me, and you got the right to kill me now, and I wouldn't blame you if you do. But if you... but." You ought to thank me before I die for the gravel in your gut and the spit in your eye because I'm the man that named you Sue. Yeah, what could I do? I got all choked up and threw down my gun, called him my pa, and he called me his son, and I came away with a different point of view. Now, this fictitious father prepared his son for a rough life by being absent and giving him a shameful name. The faithful father prepares their son or daughter for life by being present and giving them an honorable example. See, that's what God has called us to do as fathers, to be that honorable example and be present. And it's too easy to disconnect, to hide our face in a phone or in the TV and not know what's actually going on in the life of our children. If we want our children to live honorably and follow Christ, we need to model that to them. Amen? Now, if we're going to prepare our kids for some things, we need to know what's most important. And here's the point I'm going to make. What is more important? Preparing your child for a successful career or preparing them for eternity. They're both important. But preparing your child for eternity is the most important responsibility we have as parents. What about preparing your child to be a professional athlete by taking them to every sporting thing that they could be involved in or preparing them to fight the good fight of faith. Fight of faith. Preparing your child to be responsible or preparing them for redemption. You see, I think we have our priorities of parenting off sometimes. All good things, but not the best things. And we need to put those things to the forefront. And if you look at the book of Revelation, it is, in its truest sense, a book of preparation. It is God showing us that sin has drastic consequences. And to the one who believes in Jesus, it's preparing us for the glory that Christ purchased for us. But for the unrepentant, for the stubborn and hard-hearted who are committed to doing it their way and not God's way, it is an eye-opening experience into seeing what their life will lead to. Revelation is a book preparing us for the future. 
for tomorrow and for the end of days so that we are on the right side of God's coming. Because when Jesus returns, you're going to either be on the right or the left. The sheep who are welcomed into eternity in the new heaven and new earth or the goats who depart from him are in eternal darkness and punishment forever. We want to be on the right side of that line of demarcation. We want to know our Savior, not reject him. And so today, part of the warning and the preparation is this command that Jesus gives right in the middle of the passage. Stay awake and stay dressed. Be prepared. Don't be unprepared. Don't let that day of his coming take you by surprise. You are not in the darkness. You are in the light and you should be ready. That's what a good parent does. They make their children ready. They prepare them for the things that are most important. For a rough life, for a great life, and everything in between, parents prepare their children. And our Heavenly Father wants to prepare us for the days ahead. Amen? So we've got to talk about the context of this passage. Seven angels flying out of the heavenly temple with seven cups or bowls of wrath. Okay, it seems pretty intense. And if you remember, all throughout the book of Revelation, there's these cycles of seven. Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven signs, and now the seven cups or bowls that we're studying. But there's a very strong parallel between the seven trumpets that we've already covered and the seven cups. Whatever plague is poured out in the trumpet judgment, you see the same thing being poured out on the same things, but in more intensity in the cups. So let's review the first four just quickly, and then we'll get into our passage. So trumpet number one, God has that trumpet blow and judgment is poured out upon the whole earth. So it's worldwide. Hail and fire mixed with blood fall from heaven and a third of the earth was burned up. But in our passage from last week, we saw this cup that the angel pours out. He pours it out upon the earth. So it's a worldwide judgment. That's where they're the same. And this first plague is painful sores upon all those who took the mark of the beast and worship his image. So the unbelievers, those who have rejected Jesus. Okay, that's plague number one. Then trumpet number two, something like a great mountain was thrown into the sea. It splashes into the sea and one third of the sea became blood and one third of the living things in the sea died. Now we see the intensity factor increasing in the end days with this second cup. This cup, the angel pours out upon the sea, just like the trumpet was blown and the sea was affected. But this plague, it isn't a third of the sea becomes blood, but all the sea, all the waters of the ocean upon the entire face of the earth. And most of the earth is water, becomes blood and all the living things die. Nothing survives this plague in the ocean. Trumpet number three, a great star fell from heaven and it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. So the drinking water supply is affected in that trumpet judgment. In the same way, cup number three is poured out on the rivers and streams, the drinking water and all the drinking water becomes blood. How long do you think humanity is going to survive when all they have to drink is blood? They won't. Not but a few days. Okay, so this is clearly the end of human history being spoken about. This is one of the final judgments right before Jesus returns. And once again, the believers are in heaven. And they are the ones watching this judgment upon those who hated Jesus and rejected him. And so this is a reminder for all those who think it's my life. I can do whatever I want. You can But there is a cost and there's a judgment that will come upon all those who reject Jesus. And this is a sneak peek into what those judgments will be. Trumpet four, the last one we covered last week, a third of the sun was struck when the trumpet blew a third of the moon and a third of the stars. So of all the light bearing sources in the universe, a third of their light was darkened. Okay. This fourth cup parallels that. The judgment, the plague is poured out on the sun and the sun is allowed to scorch people with fire. 
And look at what the people do. It says that they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues and the people did not repent and give him glory. You know, sometimes when you have children, you give them punishment, not because you like to punish them, but because they did something wrong and you're trying to teach them that what you did will result in this punishment and it needs to be unpleasant enough that they're like, you know what? I don't want to face that again. So when I'm tempted to make that decision next time, I'm going to choose not to, to make it because I remember what that punishment was like. And here God is giving these plagues and punishments and wicked, sinful man is not turning it around continuing in it, not repenting, and giving him glory. And so that's what we're going to see as we begin the fifth, sixth, and seventh cups. Let's read them, and then we'll find out what we need to learn from them. Stand with me, please, in honor of God's word, starting at Revelation 16, verse 10. Keep in mind, this is a passage of preparation, and it parallels the trumpets we saw before. So... Revelation 16.10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. They are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God, the almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath, and every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. You can be seated. That last verse brings us right up to Jesus descending with the cry of an archangel riding on a white horse coming to judge the nations once and for all. That is what we read in Revelation 19. And just so you know, these last two cups we read, six and seven, are then explained in full detail in Revelation 17, 18, and 19. That is, it's like an expanded, exhaustive version of what this just gives us a little peek of, okay? All the details are filled in in the following chapters. So let's talk about this first verse and this fifth cup that's poured out. And here it is. The fifth angel poured out his bowl or cup on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. Now, this is that fifth expression of God's wrath and God is wrathful towards the beast. Well, who or what is the beast? Remember, revelation is highly symbolic. So we had the vision of the dragon and we're told that that dragon was Satan himself. Then we have the beast Okay, that is a culmination of nations that have gathered together against Christ and his church, but it can also be an individual who is leading that culmination of nations known as the Antichrist. Okay, that Antichrist will have a worldwide empire or kingdom. You remember my Star Wars analogy from last week? You have the galactic empire with the dark Lord leading it. And then you have the resistance, the rebels. We, the church, are the rebels. We are the resistance against the kingdom of darkness. And yet God's judgment is highly ironic. He takes the kingdom of darkness and he plunges it into darkness. 
as a judgment upon it. So this wrath of God is poured out on the throne or the power of the Antichrist, the beast, the one who is leading the whole entire world astray right before Jesus returns. And he plunges that kingdom into darkness. And look at the result. People nod their tongues in anguish. Have you ever been in so much torment and pain that you are biting on your tongue? You know when somebody goes through some painful ordeal and they give them a stick to bite on? That whole idea? So they don't bite their tongue off? The people in the end days, they don't even have that to relieve their pain. They basically are gnawing their tongue off in anguish. And with that mangled tongue, they are cursing the God of heaven for their pain and their sores. Notice what cup judgment resulted in painful sores over their whole body. The first one. So it's not like one plague happens and then it goes away and then the next plague. These compound upon one another. They're not experiencing one plague, but all of them in succession and all of them together. So the plague of sores and then the bloody ocean and sea and then the drinking water of blood. And all these things are compounded upon one another. And here you have the people crying out. And what do they do? They curse the God of heaven for their pain and sores. You see, that is the characteristic of an unbeliever, somebody who curses God. Do you know how many people are tempted when great sorrow, suffering, and tragedy is introduced into their life and our first and sinful inclination is to curse God for it. And, and the subtle implication is we have some right theology with a wrong interpretation. We say, well, if God is all powerful, then God could cause this to not happen. And because he is causing this to happen, he's to blame. Can I remind you of some truths that are very important? We live in a fallen world. A broken system where sin, death, and disease exist. So the cancer I've been diagnosed with, am I to blame God for it? No. But has he allowed it? Yes. And does he have a good reason for allowing it? Absolutely. And I may not know that reason. But I know that he is good. Amen. I know that he holds the world in his hands. And that includes me, my wife, and my children. And I know that I have nothing to fear. Because he is with me wherever I go. And the same is true for you. It's not true for me because I'm a pastor and this is what I do. And then somehow I'm special to God. I'm no more special to God than you are. I am just like you. And I have the same truths and the same struggles and the same things that I have to wrestle through as you do. And the greatest problem in the heart and mind of the believer is the temptation to blame God for the things they don't like. Don't take the bait. Don't listen to the dragon's lying tongue. Don't Take that in because he is, no matter what circumstance you are facing, he is the God who loves you, who gave his only son to die on the cross for you to make all your wrongs right. So you might not see resolution in this life, but you will in the life to come. He has redeemed us from this fallen world and we have all the reason in the world to thank him for it and not curse him for it. And that is what? Satan wants us to do. And that is what the unbelieving world will do. So don't be like the unbeliever and curse God for the things that are happening in your life. Praise him for his goodness and his good plan through the difficulties. Why do you think Peter says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds? It doesn't sound like God's word is giving us the opportunity to complain to God but to rejoice in him for what he's going to do. They did not repent of their deeds. 
We don't have an excuse. We are hearing God's word. We know what we're to do. We're seeing what sinful living leads to, and we have an opportunity to turn from it and not continue in it. And unfortunately, some people continue down that road of rejecting Christ and living for themselves because they think, well, this won't happen to me. Do you know how many people have shipwrecked their life and their faith because they believe the lie that, well, that will happen to other people, but that won't happen to me. We're no different than anybody else who has fallen into those traps and we need to guard our steps. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So the beast, the Antichrist kingdom is devastated. People are in torment continually and that parallels the fifth trumpet. When those locusts out of the deep dark pit come up and they torment people for five months, then they wish that they could die. That's the fifth trumpet. This is the fifth cup of God's wrath where people are in torment again. Now the angel pours out not on the throne of the beast, but on the great river Euphrates. And the river was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. This river, the mighty Euphrates river, completely dries up and it's like a highway leading to the plains of Megiddo where the final battle of sinful humanity will take place when they think they will finally overthrow Christ and his kingdom and war against God and God will surprise them. Now, why is the river Euphrates important for us? Biblically speaking, if you look at the river Euphrates, it shows up in the beginning of creation. You look at the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.10. Turn there with me. There's two very important points where the river Euphrates is mentioned. The Garden of Eden and the Abrahamic Covenant. This is pretty fascinating, so bear with me on this one. Genesis 2, verse 10. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. It flowed out of Eden, so its source was in Eden. And there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river, river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Okay? So Euphrates was there as a part of the beginning. Then God said to Abraham in Genesis 15, 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now the name Euphrates literally means breaking forth of liquid or to gush forth. So it is this mighty great river that is going to no longer be gushing forth with water. And what's interesting is This Euphrates River is believed to be the cradle of civilization because we read that the Garden of Eden was in that area. The River Euphrates is still around and it's believed that the first humans, Adam and Eve, and all of humanity and human civilization was birthed in this cradle of civilization on the Euphrates River. Now, isn't it interesting that the Euphrates River symbolizes the beginning of humanity and the drying up of the Euphrates will lead to the end of fallen humanity. Where it began is where it's going to end. The very place where the Garden of Eden and man's rebellion against God started is the same place where God will crush the rebellion of fallen humanity. God has a way of wrapping up loose ends, doesn't he? In the same way that the first woman disobeyed God's command, God used a woman to declare the resurrection of Christ in the beginning to correct that wrong. In the same way as fallen humanity began in this area, it will also end. Another interesting point about Euphrates is the city of Babylon was on the shores of the Euphrates River. Now, Babylon is important in the book of Revelation and scripturally because it is the most mentioned city in all the New Testament. 
It's like 287 times. Babylon no longer existed. Doesn't exist today. But it is symbolic of the pinnacle of man's wickedness. Human civilization that grew from the Garden of Eden and it spread across the face of the earth. And this symbolic city of Babylon is the wicked culture of today. It exists in the United States. It exists on social media platforms. It exists in your neighborhood. It exists everywhere. The city of Babylon has taken over the world as we know it. Now the kingdom of God is fighting against it. The kingdom of darkness is the city of Babylon ruled by the Antichrist. And yet this kingdom of God is this city of light. And we are a part of that city. Babylon is going to fall But before that, we see where the source of humanity's deception comes from. And I saw, John says, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. This is a little weird. Revelation is a little weird. Can we agree with that? You have the unholy trinity and the Holy Trinity. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. And you have Satan, the master copycat. He wants to create a counterfeit trinity. So he has the dragon, which is Satan himself, the beast, which is the Antichrist, and then the false prophet, the second beast, who are in unison trying to lead the world into darkness. And they are motivated by these deceptive demonic spirits that are symbolized by frogs. Anybody like frogs? Yeah. All right, one. Okay. Frogs can actually be pretty cool little creatures. Snakes, not so much. (laughs) But frogs, I don't like to touch them. I'll look at them. Um, You know, I didn't grow up in the country. I wish I did. You know, some people are like, oh, frogs will play with them, toads. I'm like, no. (laughs) Throw them on the barbecue? Yay, no. Some people like them. Somebody who will remain un, unnamed, Rosie, said that frog legs aren't that bad. Her husband, Alan, I'm getting a thumbs up from the back, right? I'm, I'm good. I don't need to taste that. But these unclean spirits, you see that? Frogs, unclean. They come out of the mouth of these, this unholy trinity. But look at what these demonic spirits do. They perform signs miraculous things in the natural world. And they go abroad, hopping across the earth, it seems, to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. They are going to gather the mob of wickedness across the face of the earth. All the nations are going to gather their forces, the wicked united nations of that day, And they're going to assemble to fight against Christ and his kingdom and all those who follow him. That is their goal. And that's what these frog-like demonic spirits will do. But here is Jesus interjecting in all this picture of great plagues, great destruction. God is pouring out his wrath on humanity. Nobody wants to be alive during that day. All are wishing that they would just be able to die. They won't be allowed to until the end comes And yet Jesus says this, behold, I am coming like a thief. He's saying, look, wake up. These things are going to happen. Don't be deceived. Don't think, oh no, that's fiction. That's myth. These things won't happen. If you look through the Bible, how it is foretold, the events of human history, it foretold them to a T thousands of times throughout scripture. Nobody's been able to disprove those things. So if the Bible has been right about all these things, human nature, human history, the coming of Christ, the death of Christ, his resurrection, the birth of the church, the continuation of the church, all these things, do you really think the last thing the Bible says is going to be the one thing that ends up being wrong? It's all been right. So we have to wake up and Jesus says, I am coming like a thief, meaning... I'm going to come when you don't expect it. So you have to stay ready. Stay awake. Remember Jesus' disciples, the three who were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, stay awake. What did they do? Fell asleep. I would have totally fallen asleep. I'll admit it. 
Jesus would have rebuked me and be like, you couldn't stay awake for an hour? I would have been sawn logs for sure. Uh, interesting enough, it has nothing to do with the sermon. Um, apparently the other night after my nasal surgery, uh, I was snoring up a storm, right? Not only was I snoring, I was whistling. <laughs> Not a new trick that I think my wife is a fan of. I would have never believed her, but she recorded me. <laughs> she forgot she recorded me. So she was looking through her phone in her pictures and she sees, sees this black picture. She's like, what's that? She plays a video. She goes, oh my gosh, I did record you. And she played it and it was awful. <laughs> Next morning, I'm like, babe, why do you look like you didn't sleep? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but seriously, it was this weird, nasty whistle. And I hope they didn't like screw something up. And now she's going to have to deal with that. So pray for my wife is my point. Uh, but stay awake. Don't fall into the sinful sleep of slumber. We're to stay awake. That doesn't mean you can't go to sleep at night. Physical sleep, good. Spiritual sleep, not so good. The Bible tells us to stay awake and be ready and keep your garments on. Okay? Nobody wants, why are people looking at each other? <laughs> I don't care how you sleep. It's between you and your family. But the reality is, if some tragedy strikes, right? You don't want to be the person running out of your house with no clothes on, right? Everybody's thought of that before. We live in California. Great big earthquake. Nobody wants to be running out of the house not realizing that they forgot something or a few things. And here, there's many people forgetting things in their life. They are spiritually naked and they will be exposed they are not clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Their sinfulness is all over them. It hasn't been washed off. They haven't been clothed. And Jesus said, hey, stay awake. Keep your garments on. See, when you're done with your work day and you get cleaned up, that's when you take your clothes off and you get dressed into something else because your work is done. And we are clothed in the work and righteousness of Christ right now. And our work is not done. Many people who start to get older in their years think, I'm out of my prime, I'm not useful anymore, my work is done, I've officially retired from my career, and so now I'm just going to do whatever I want. Please don't hold that perspective. You are allowing the enemy to rob from you of maybe the most productive and enjoyable years of your life. You're not strapped down to a career maybe anymore. So you can throw yourself into the good works God has for you. You could bless so many people and impact so many lives in the little and big things that God has gifted you in. So don't think that your ministry days are over, that your usefulness is done. If you have breath in your lungs, God's going, I want you to glorify me. I have amazing things for you to be a part of, but maybe you're sleeping in and just not not passionate about your life anymore. Maybe you've believed the lie that you're no good, that you're not worth it, that you're not special. Though all those things are big, fat lies from the enemy. Your best years are ahead, no matter what age you are. Stop living in the past. Look forward to Jesus coming. He said, blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps working, keeps his garments on. And they assembled, all of them, all the wicked, to that plain called Megiddo. In Hebrew, it's called Armageddon. That's the final battle and when human history will end and human eternity with Christ will continue. Let's wrap this up quickly. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. There's judgment on the sun. There's judgment on the sea. Now there's judgment on the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. Has this voice utter, uttered those words before? Yes. Jesus on the cross, it is finished. What was finished on the cross? Our sin was paid for. Those who believe in Jesus. But the sins who do not believe in Jesus have not been punished until here. They endured the seven plagues of the cup judgments. He says it is done and they will now be separated from God forever and put into the lake of fire with the unholy trinity. He says it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. 
That will be the big one. Many Californians were waiting for the big one. You know, that earthquake that's going to happen. Just like I said, global warming will happen when the sun is allowed to scorch people on the earth on the last day. That's when global warming will definitely happen. This is when the big one will happen. The last and final judgment, the seventh cup. And the great city, this is Babylon, split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. That is saying that all the wicked culture of humanity will crumble and fall once and for all. Every island fled away. No mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. They cursed God for the plague of hail because the plague was so severe. We're done. So how do we wrap that up? Look at how sinful humanity ends their existence. They continue to curse God. Rather than seeking forgiveness and repenting of their sins, they curse God for the plague of the hail because that plague was so severe. Utter panic and devastation. The entire world is judged in that moment. You see, on this Father's Day, it's important that we understand tenacity. I believe that many men today are passive. That they've been beaten down and broken and convinced that they're the problem in the world today. I believe that godly men are the solution. I believe that they're called to love their wives and the women in their life and around them and honor them well to protect them and lead them and sacrifice their life for them. To do the same for their children, to lead by example, but they have to be tenacious. Tenacity means this, the quality or fact of being able to grip something firmly. You know, I gave a message during Christmas time about holding fast and what it means to hold fast in faith. And the tenacious person can hold firmly to their faith as Christ is holding firmly to them. It's a quality or fact of being very determined. The act of determination There's also the quality or fact of continuing to exist and not giving up. You see, we need to be tenacious as believers to not let ourselves or our children be seduced by our culture. Too many men today are just throwing digital objects into the hands of their children with no teaching, with no insight, with no filter, no protection. And then years later, you wonder why your children are seeming to be so lost in sin. You have to understand the influences we allow. The dad is the gatekeeper of the home. So is the mom. But we either let the enemy in or we keep the enemy out. And too many have let the enemy into their life and into their eyes and into their heart. And they are doing the same for their children. Allowing the enemy in. You have to kick him out of your life first to keep him out of your children's life second. Does that make sense? We can't allow the enemy a room in our house. TV room, living room, computer room, whatever it is, he doesn't get a room. The only reason we ended up in Norco was the calling of God. But my wife literally typed in how many people were in our family and that many rooms in a house. And there was actually a room, that, a house that showed up. The only one, it's the house we live in now. Because we wanted everybody to have their room. We didn't ask for an extra room so Satan could have a place. He doesn't deserve a spot, a moment, an inch, a corner in your home. And too many of us have given him a run of the whole place. We gave him the keys. He can come and go as he pleases. He sits down at the dinner table, sits down on the couch next to us, and he just whispers lies and seduces us over and over and over and our children with us. That is one of the greatest battles I believe men can do today is kick the enemy out of their life and their home. Stop allowing him in through the things that you watch, listen to, or partake in. And you'll see a drastic change in your life and in your children. So we are responsible as men to do that. We have to be ready 
1 Thessalonians 5.1, I'll end with this. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Wake up, stay dressed, be sober in the Lord, and walk with him. There is much to be done, and do not allow the enemy to seduce you and lead you astray in these days in which we live in. Our lives, the life of our children, depend on it. The life of our nation and our culture depends on it. But we need godly men and godly women to stay awake, to be dressed appropriately in the righteousness of Christ, and resist the devil. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, a little longer than I anticipated, uh, but Lord, I pray that the truth that has been spoken from your word will remain in the hearts and minds of everybody who is here today and hears this. I pray, Lord, that we would not be like the wicked who continue in their sin no matter what is happening, but may we listen up, may we wake up and turn from our wicked ways. May we throw away and get rid of all the things that are leading us and our family into sin. Help us to guard our homes. Let our homes be a refuge and a sanctuary rather than a den of sin. Help us, Lord, to not make room for sin and Satan to live in our lives, but may you purge us, cleanse us, and push him out in every way, and may we be different than the unbelieving world around us. May we walk in the light and not in the darkness, and may we know the joy of your coming. For Jesus, you are coming. And for the unbeliever, it will be extremely unexpected. But for us, we are aware, awake, and ready. And may we remain that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just in that short moment I had to just pray and reflect on what I would say to you in closing. I don't want to miss the opportunity to highlight this truth. That some of us today have some things that need to change. You've heard God's word. There's been certain things that have penetrated your heart and you know it to be true. And when you leave here, you're gonna to try to excuse it away. You're gonna to try to justify the way you're living or the things you're participating in that maybe you shouldn't be. Don't justify it, get rid of it. Here's the thing you need to understand. Willpower isn't enough. In your own strength, your sinful nature, you can't change you're like a leopard that can't change its spots. It's impossible. You're a sinner. You can't stop being a sinner unless God does a work of grace in your life. That's why we sang Amazing Grace. It's His grace that changes the sinner's heart, that changes our mind. You see, repentance is something that we cannot do. We don't have the ability unless God grants us the ability. So our change starts with praying and confessing our sins and asking God to change us. Asking God to cause us to repent. Helping us to turn from those things that are owning us so that we can be truly free from any habit, any sin, any addiction, anything we're participating in. And that is one of the greatest things you can do as a father is get rid of those things in your life and live a free life so your children can be free. Don't miss that opportunity today. Amen? So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you all. Thanks for coming.